in putting this talk together, I thought I would spend a lot of time trying to sort of put uh, the biology in place and not so much emphasis on the high parallel of computing because you guys know all of that. So why are we doing this and why do we care about the genetic architecture of breast cancer in sub-Saharan Africa? One of the things that, uh, of three things that I heard uh, at the State of the Union address last night was precision medicine, the fact that we have to do more investment in precision medicine. And uh, to do precision medicine, you have to study the entire world. Otherwise, you can't really make anything precise. Um, I also heard a lot about climate change. And, uh, and I think some of the work that we're doing in sub-Saharan Africa and some of the, really the conflicts that we are concerned about in the world uh, can be solved by global health diplomacy. And that's why I'm really proud to be uh, the director of the Center for Global Health at the University of Chicago because I really truly believe that uh, there's a lot of cross-learning that we can do across um, nations and nationalities. Okay, all right. So uh, some of the uh, reasons that we actually went um, to begin to think about breast cancer is really the well-documented disparity in breast cancer mortality in the U.S., where you we've actually made significant gains in terms of um, reducing breast cancer mortality. Uh, but what's happened is that because the U.S. is such a diverse uh, um, a nation of immigrants, we find that um, it's really been challenging to know exactly um, what to do when each person comes to you uh, with a new diagnosis of breast cancer. So what's been known is that in general, when people do aggregate, they always have data in terms of black and white. But as geneticists, genomicists, we know that it's not so clear cut uh, in terms of what is the racial ethnic uh, disparities that people are talking about. And that's why there's really been movement to go beyond uh, racial categorization to really talking more precisely about precision oncology and precision medicine. So our interest really came from really having a good understanding of breast cancer as a global disease that affects women. The reason why anyone gets breast cancer or anyone gets prostate cancer is if you're a man, you're more likely to get prostate cancer. It doesn't matter whether you're black, white, whatever you are. And if you're a, a, a woman, you're more likely to get uh, breast cancer. And the incidence of cancer is exploding. And the reason why it's exploding worldwide and we're all sort of paying a global attention to cancer is because all of the you know, infectious diseases, the, the childhood illnesses, a lot of things that had put a lot of countries behind in terms of their global development are being solved. So people are living longer. Uh, and so now when looking at global trends in, in cancer, uh, the UN in 2011 had uh, a, a declaration on chronic non-communicable conditions. And the reason why they had that declaration was that that's the looming epidemic where every country, every nation, their development is going to be hindered by people who are getting older and are developing chronic conditions. And cancer happens to be one chronic condition, but that chronic condition is actually, and the risk factors for it is shared by everything, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity. And so in thinking about how we um, uh, approach our work, we really wanted to set up an infrastructure to be able to collect data to inform chronic non-communicable conditions in general. But because my work started with breast cancer, we really developed an infrastructure to study breast cancer. And the country we work in is Nigeria. If you look at worldwide uh, breast cancer uh, mortality rates, you see that some Western countries are doing really well. Eastern Europe, it still has a very high mortality, and that's probably because of the lag uh, in, in terms of their health infrastructure. So we talk about precision medicine, we talk about climate change, and then we're talking about health systems because these health systems impact how we deliver precision medicine. 
So when I look at this geography and we look at the, the countries with the highest incidence, you find that a lot of them are in sub-Saharan Africa or in Latin America. And, uh, and a lot of places where we have data, lots and lots of data, will be in the Western world, you know, Western Europe, um, Australia. Uh, but even in Britain, they're not doing as well. And the, the, the challenge for the, some of the uh, European countries is really how they aggregate their data, how they look at data. And uh, I talked to my colleagues in Britain and I said, you know, we know that in the U.S. we celebrate diversity. But in Britain, you don't want to hear anything about, you know, racial categorization. So what's happening to British blacks? And they can't tell me much about it just because of the way people collect data. So the U.S. has done a, mo a much better job of looking at data. And that's why we are now thinking about uh, breast cancer, not in terms of black-white disparity, but in terms of what we even know about the diversity of what is called breast cancer. And genomic analysis is what got us to actually looking at it. For those of you who are not a biologists, if you look at this, this map here of individual breast cancers, you can see that there's a lot of difference uh, from this breast cancer that is HER2 positive. This is one of the genes that's highly amplified and overexpressed in breast cancer. Uh, lots of uh, uh, interest in the stroma, what's making up the surrounding environment of this breast cancer. And then you compare that to this breast cancer or this breast cancer that is abundantly estrogen receptor positive, and this one that is HER2 positive and, or, uh, and uh, estrogen receptor uh, positive. So when you boil it down to the individual level, you now see the diversity, not only at the population level, but at each cell level of the tumor that you're trying to treat, there's significant heterogeneity and significant the challenge that we have trying to now make this precise in terms of precision medicine. So when we notice this diversity in terms of all the different types of breast cancer that people have, uh, we did a very simple experiment, which was to go to different parts or look at data from different parts of the world and then ask, if you look in aggregate at different populations, what types of breast cancer do they have? And, uh, and you can do uh, what is called gene expression profiling, or you can do a tissue microarray and look at lots and lots of tumors on a, on a, on a, uh, on a tissue microarray. And when we did that experiment, we also saw a pattern that was sort of interesting. One was that if you go from Japan and Asian countries, where in fact we've always known that they tend to do very well when they have breast cancer. People tend to live to very old ages. And when you actually look at tumors from Asian countries, they seem to be much, much different than tumors from uh, other parts of the world. And so when we look at um, the mean age of uh, in this publication that was looking at the different types of breast cancer, it was clear that there was really very little basal-like or unclassified breast tumors in the Asian uh, 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 communities. A recent paper in JAMA showed that even in the United States, if you categorize by uh, uh, racial ethnic categories, Asian populations are more likely to be diagnosed with stage one breast cancer then, then a seven year survival is almost 97%. And they just survive breast cancer because they tend to get the smaller growing, uh, 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 slow growing type of breast cancer. And the more African ancestry you have, the younger the age of diagnosis of breast cancer, and the more likely you are to have this pattern of highly aggressive breast cancer in these populations. And then for whites and other populations in the U.S., they're somewhat in between the Asian and the African ancestry. And so the question then is, what's causing that diversity? Uh, what's responsible for that? Uh, in the uh, uh, surveillance and epidemiology end results uh, uh, database in the U.S., it's now been mandated that you shouldn't just report breast cancer as breast cancer. You now have to report on the different types of breast cancer, because it's when we get that type of granular data that we can now begin to interpret 
all of our, 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 our mortality based on what's going on. So this is a very nice uh, paper from the population-based uh, cancer registry in California, where now they're looking at what are the things that are killing uh, uh, women in California. California has a very uh, diverse population, and the top killer is still lung cancer because women started smoking. And globally, one of the emerging epidemic is also, of course, uh, uh, lung cancer in women across racial ethnic groups. But once you go beyond lung and colon cancer, now we have different types of breast cancer. Nine uh, percent, almost 27,000 women uh, died from um, breast lumina. This is supposed to be the slow growing type of breast cancer. It still kills women. It doesn't mean that it's not going to kill you. And then ovarian cancer. And the most aggressive, these are like breast cancer, which tends to be overrepresented in individuals of African ancestry. So when you look at the top six killers of women, uh, this, this breast, pancreas, ovary, and especially uh, luminal, uh, uh, basal breast cancer form a significant problem. So we've been interested in really trying to understand this basal-like breast cancer or the ER-negative breast cancer. And because people always do categorization by racial grouping, I actually had a very nice uh, a white woman in Hyde Park who came to see me in the clinic because I'm also a doctor. And so I see people from all over the city coming to my clinic. And this woman got triple negative breast cancer when she was 68. And her doctor had said, go and get your mammogram, go and get it every two years. If you're, you know, once you're over the age of 50, she did exactly, you know, three days to the time. Two years later, she had this horrible, aggressive breast cancer, and she was dead within a year, right? And when we've looked at the data, it's become clear that whatever it is that we were doing before in terms of thinking about a message to the general population, go and get your mammogram and you're going to, you know, get your cancer diagnosed early. We now have to realize all that data because it doesn't work, right? So um, we had a, uh, a, a, a meeting in, in, um, in Switzerland on, you know, from a hundred top oncologists all over the world. And we were sort of lamenting what was the problem with cancer medicine? Why is cancer still so intractable? Why can't we really eradicate it? And one of the things that was really important from all these people from all over the world was that we had to think about new models of research. And that, you know, while we've really understood molecular mechanisms at the basic level, uh, part of our challenge is that we don't have population level data. Right. We predict that this drug should work for this type of breast cancer. And then when we get it to the patient, it doesn't answer, you know, doesn't respond the way we predicted it. So now we have to think about new models of research. This is why this cloud series is such an important uh, 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 project, because we have to begin to think interdisciplinarily and we have to think about where do we get evidence? How much evidence do we need? How do we get the data? How do we crunch the data? And how do we make meaning of all this big data that we're all talking about? So my view of sub-Saharan Africa is actually changed the more I go to sub-Saharan Africa because it has the largest demographic, you know, young people, lots of people in sub-Saharan Africa, lots of research questions to answer. But all we hear about uh, sub-Saharan Africa is, oh, there's this war there, and there's that war there, and there's this poverty and let's go and do an emergency, there's Ebola. But when I go there, I see people like um, my friend who is working in Kampala to treat breast cancer patients. And I see mammography, uh, uh, you know, things that have been shipped from Boston because they didn't want to use it anymore. And they want them to use it for breast cancer. And of course it gets there, it doesn't help anybody because it's useless. No, they don't even have roads to get these mammography machines to there. And so we've been really thinking about, we have to do research in a different model and we have to get evidence because there's really no evidence that sending a, a, a mammography machine from the Harvard Medical School to the medical school in Uganda is going to solve any problem, right? Because the data that we have from the US is that 
When we've used mammography machines and we've asked everybody to go and get diagnosed with breast cancer, we've actually run into the problem of diagnosing cancers that may not kill you. So we call it doctor carcinoma in situ. So we have overdiagnosed cancer, we have overtreated it, and we have not made a dent in the bad cancers that actually kill women. And so if we're going to export anything, we shouldn't export bad science because we now know better, right? And so when we know better, one of the things that, that's actually led to significant advances in our ability to treat and, and diagnose breast cancer was that we started treating it as a systemic disease. We started using chemotherapy. And so if you look at uh, what has happened in the 1980s, we were doing screening. And then we started in the 80s to start using chemotherapy and tamoxifen as a targeted therapy. And we started seeing significant differences in survival. And what we had learned by actually looking at the patterns of care in Chicago is that if you need to diagnose breast cancer, and then after diagnosis, you need effective treatment, well, you know, uh, folks at the Computational Institute have been doing resource mapping on the south side of Chicago. And the problem is that the resources don't map the population, right? So there are populations here who we will send mammography machines to go and get their breast cancer diagnosed. And if we look at the map of where the doctors are, the doctors are all on the north side of Chicago where there's money. So we tend to go where the money is, not where the population is to actually make an impact in the work that we're doing. And as a result of that, I don't know if this is showing, but as a result of that, this is where all the accredited cancer programs are, um, more localized on the, on the north side of Chicago. That's your triangles. And then the populations that are dying at the highest rate, so age-adjusted breast cancer mortality, they're all on the south side of Chicago and a bit on the west side. So if you look at Chicago demographics, women of African ancestry are more likely to be in segregated neighborhoods in Chicago. And so that's why we then started thinking about what is it that is uh, access? What is it that is genetic? And how do we ask those questions? And um, in our work, the first thing we wanted to do was to look at, um, you know, sort of the um, inherited predisposition. So if you think about the human genome and you think about the origin of our populations, everyone talks about out of Africa, right? That the more you dig deep, the more you actually see that the largest uh, human diversity is on the continent of Africa. And then out of Africa came all of us and our genomes. So 99.9% .9 of the genomes are identical. However, there's also been recent immigration. So the slave trade and forced immigration brought a lot of people into the new world. And so now you have mixed ancestry, both in, in South America, in, uh, in, in North America, and, and all over the world. So the question is, what's genetic in terms of so the basic understanding of the genetic contribution to disparity, and then what's the forced immigration and, you know, and, and social issues that actually led to, uh, 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 um, you know, uh, on, unequal distribution of genotypes in breast cancer. So we have that study funded, and we're going to be doing 2,000 breast cancer cases and 2,000 controls, just looking at every breast cancer patient and then figuring out what is you know, inherited predisposition. We also have another uh, 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 really interesting project funded, which is, okay, now you have breast cancer and you have tumors. Why do some people have the most aggressive type of tumors? And if, if your germline determines the type of somatic mutations in your tumor, then we ought to really do a good annotation, whole genome annotation of well uh, phenotyped breast cancer cases. And so we used uh, Nigerian uh, breast cancer infrastructure to actually begin to ask that question where we, by now we've recruited more than 5,000 cases and controls from three countries in West Africa. We've looked at, um, uh, we have studies going on in Nigeria, in Cameroon, in Uganda. And then uh, as a result of my going around and talking about health equity, 
that you really shouldn't be selling drugs in places where you haven't done the study. Uh, we're actually now uh, having a collaboration with Novartis Institute for Bi Biomedical Research, where we're going to now uh, join up with the work we're already doing to do exome sequencing of a lot of uh, uh, breast cancer tumors from uh, Nigeria. And at the end of it, what we want to do is to strengthen a sustainable translational research infrastructure and to train people locally to be able to mine data, use data, and use that data to inform their practice. And so we have uh, a whole host of things that we're already doing. Uh, we're computing on Beagle. We're uh, sharing space with um, uh, uh, and uh, Jason Pitt, who is a graduate student in IGSB, has been uh, involved in the study. And, and so far, uh, what we are looking at is really, um, you know, there are two uh, uh, aspects to this work. We want to make sure that we can uh, have large data, have a good uh, 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 repository, and then have the analytic pipeline to be able to do the work. And I can tell you that without the support of Lorenzo and a lot of people from the Computational Institute, without Beagle, uh, a lot of the work that we're doing would not really be uh, as uh, well annotated as we are planning to do it. At the end of the day, there are three things that we want to do. We want to get risk alleles and to be able to really look at uh, risk uh, factors for breast cancer and be able to do predictive uh, risk assessment. You need like, lots and lots of data and you need the diversity of the data that we can only get from uh, a sub-Saharan Africa. And we're going to be doing lots of um, uh, experiments to that. Then to look at the other side, to get effective therapies, you have to now figure out what's going on with the tumors and be able to develop effective therapies for the type of breast cancer that people are getting based on really getting good intelligence on what the tumors look like. So, uh, of course, there's not enough money to do a lot of the uh, analysis that we would like to do. And the next few uh, slides are just talking about some of the um, analytic uh, 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 approaches that we've had to, to do to make sure that, number one, because this is a previously unstudied and understudied population, uh, that we can really develop uh, pipelines. And um, Swift State is a pipeline that was developed uh, uh, with help from the um, Computational Institute. By doing that, it's allowed us to be able to actually uh, uh, be, do our analysis much, much faster than we can ever, could ever have predicted. It would allow us to be able to do, the, um, to do fewer samples, to look at uh, what, um, uh, uh, how we will be able to uh, do our calling. And uh, I'm just going to go through this really quickly that we have uh, taken advantage of the parallel computing that Vigo offers us to be able to really um, develop our variant uh, calls and then to now think about integrating genotype with phenotypes. So we will be able to, cop, uh, to do single nucleotide variants. We'll be able to call indels. Indels happen to be very important when we're talking about uh, deleterious mutations in cancer predisposition genes. And as a clinician, I don't, I'm not so, I know that, you know, we may be interested in computing just to be able to make it faster. But for me, my interest is to get it to the clinic faster than anybody else. Because too many women are dying because we actually had no knowledge of what it is that would help them. So when we have meetings, I keep telling them, what's the phenotype? What is it that we're doing? And we need to get tools uh, to the clinic. So right now, uh, uh, Jason and, uh, and Youngland and everybody in our lab, they've really been you know, amazing in terms of uh, speeding up the work. Uh, we now uh, uh, have confidence that when we do use these pipelines to do our calls, uh, some of the things that we're finding are you know, uh, de uh, deleterious variants in cancer predisposition genes. So if BRIP1, BRCA1, even some of these genes have not, not been previously known to be important in cancer, how do we actually get that information back and then see how they uh, contribute to cancer in this um, uh, population? And, uh, and in parallel, we also have a, uh, a collaboration with uh, Mary Claire King at the uh, University of Seattle, where we actually have identified 
um, you know, certain genes that predispose to breast cancer. And we want to try and sequence those uh, known genes in a thousand breast cancer cases unselected for family history. And Youngland in the lab has been, um, you know, um, analyzing that. So using that approach, what we found is that if you look at 670 Nigerian breast cancer cases, this women average age is 44 when they develop breast cancer. And, and then we look at them and we look at controls that we've recruited. You can see BRCA1, BRCA2, BRIC1, P53, PAL B2, all these genes that are in the, on the top of our list, they are known cancer predisposition genes, which means that these women came into the clinic, they got breast cancer because they were born with the inherited mutation. Now, that's the kind of inherited mutation that Angelina Jolie also has and was able to go in, get uh, prophylactic surgery and do something about it. And so there's really uh, interest now in trying to distribute this knowledge to make precision medicine acceptable uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, available in anywhere in the world. We have to sort of have certain infrastructure. So this is really just looking at a notation of this large gene and the types of deleterious mutations that we've already identified in BRCA1 and BRCA2. Now we've been studying BRCA1 and BRCA2 in this country for more than 20 years. And now because of the infrastructure we've developed to study breast cancer in sub-Saharan Africa, we're now realizing it's just as common, even if not more common in those populations. And this is really talking about BRCA1 and BRCA2 being the bulk, the majority cancer predisposing gene in that population. So lots of things that we're working on. Uh, Novartis collaboration, we're really more interested in what are the drivers? What genes are actually driving tumorigenesis? How can we uh, study the samples? And we have two sites that are giving us really significant uh, good tumors. We can sequence them and we're, we're continuing to, um, to recruit samples from these places. And uh, the advantage that we have is that by being able to really get high quality tumors, um, where you know, we've developed the, the pipeline to be able to do more uh, 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 you know, large scale sequencing. And so I'm just really giving you a snippet of some of the uh, resources that we will be able to have. And for the uh, work we're doing with, um, with uh, Novartis, they're sequencing the tumors at you know, average of 150X. Uh, some of them are as high as 300X and, uh, and all these libraries and other things will be available. Let me end by saying that uh, this is the view of my lab um, when we started this collaboration where we have our data in 10 different places, uh, multiple collaborations, and we keep asking Ravi Maduri and people uh, in the Computation Institute to help us move our data so that we can actually get a hand on it. Somebody is doing uh, Ming surveys at the University of Washington. Uh, uh, Ravi's temporary surveys at the CI. Uh, there's BioNimbus. Uh, we're trying to get data from the asthma uh, studies. Uh, there's a data center in Kenwood. And there's all this stuff that's going on that is mind boggling. But I know that with the support of the cloud resources that we have here, we're going to get there because the hospital is saying $700 million for care and discovery, and it's devoted to complex specialty care with a focus on cancer and advanced surgical uh, programs. Major advances will be driven by discoveries in genomics and personalized medicine. And they put my face in all the uh, bosses in Chicago <laughs> and on there. <laughs> So I'm going to end by saying that um, you know, this has been a very um, uh, interesting journey for us. But, uh, and, and our thought now is that we should actually be you know, figuring out a way to uh, do population screening for genetic predisposition to cancer. And we'll get there. But to get there, uh, cancer is a, is a disease that has an important public health burden in all populations. Uh, we know the risk to mutations now when we screen for them and effective interventions to reduce morbidity and mortality 
among genetically susceptible people exist. And part of what we need to do as, uh, uh, with, uh, with the resources we have is to build the interdisciplinary team that would actually be able to get the uh, science out there. Okay, so lots of people working with us in Ibado, in Nigeria, and of course, resources of um, the University of Chicago to help us. <laughs>